Good morning. It's good to have Catherine and David back from Africa where they spent 10 days teaching at a Bible college, Catherine doing nursing. Um, huh? No, I mean, doctoring. And nursing, doctoring. Um, the, did, did, did you, did you uh, work with adults and children this time? Yes. David taught and Catherine went as a physician. And it's good to have them home. It's a very trying and uh, very demanding physically trip. Today we're going to conclude the teaching on faith. We spent three weeks teaching what I presented as the foundation of faith. I call it the three legs to the stool. The first was on knowing, the second was on truth and reality, and the third was on receiving. But today we're going to tie it all up. The Father has given me a very clear path through the notes today, and we're going to start out, uh, we're going to start out, I actually love when David does it, we're going to start out like a program on a mechanical cycle, where you type in the mountains, and you start off in the foothills, <clears throat> and you think, this isn't, this isn't hard, and then in about two-thirds of the way through the program, you look up, and you're about to go up a hill, straight up. And the cycle just goes to something very difficult. We're going to start today with what probably everybody teaches about faith. But we're going to end in the fourth dimension. The faith of Christ is what today's titled. To quote Star Trek, faith the final frontier. Our continuing mission to seek out new life, to boldly go where only one man has gone before. Faith, the final frontier. What do we really know about faith? What is faith to the new creation son? Most Christians today will tell you when you ask them that faith is a deep conviction of what I believe. It's a state of mind. It's a feeling. Joel Osteen will tell you it's a formula to unlock the blessings of God. Many will tell you it is a possession that can be lost. Did you know that John lost his faith last year? I'd really like a definition in the Google entry that says, faith is a gift from God that we get from reading the Bible. Faith may very well be the most often used yet most misunderstood word in the vocabulary of today's Christian. <clears throat> Very sobering, Paul tells us, and without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. Now we're in trouble. We're supposed to show up with faith and we don't even know what it is. For it is impossible to please him without faith. What is faith? It's what I believe. And you're going to please him with that answer. Let me tell you that faith is given to you in the person of a son and faith is revealed to you by the person of his spirit. We're going to make four points today. The first is faith is a person. We're told to put on Christ, to put on faith. 
Acts 17. I want to just say this one passage. Because when I read everything about putting on Christ, this is what comes to mind. For in him we live and we move and we have our being. Acts 17, 28. In him we live and move and have our being. Remember that when we talk about putting on Christ. Faith is Christ. It's the person of the Son. Romans 13, 11 through 14. Do this knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken for, from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. In Galatians 3.26, we see this. For you, for you are all sons of God through faith. And we'll look at that word in a minute. In Christ Jesus, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free man. There's neither male nor female, for you are all one, one in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 6, 10 through 17, Paul writes, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God. We've already heard that so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness, wickedness in the heavenly places. Remember that statement. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Therefore, because we're not struggling against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and the powers and the rulers of darkness, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded, put on, girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith. with which you will be able to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. The shield of faith. We're going to look at that picture in a minute of what that shield is when Paul wrote this. But I want to first talk about the flaming arrows of the evil one. You think you're saved. How do you know? Why, it's just your belief against the belief of millions. What makes you think you're right? Have you seen heaven? Do you know anybody that's ever come back and told you there was one? Do you think you're a new person? Do you still sin? How many have had those flaming 
darts of Satan. Why do you think that? Don't you want to be like God? Don't you want to be as God? You won't die. Take up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish. That's interesting. The shield of faith. Extinguishing the flaming arrows of the evil one. What did Paul have in his mind when he pictured that? Let's finish this and I'll show you. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Let's look at this. Everybody says these are pieces. Truth. The word the shield, do you realize every one of those things is Christ? Every one of this armor of God is Christ. Let's take him in order. Truth, John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth. I am the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. Put on righteousness. 1 Corinthians 1.30 But by his, doing are, by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Righteousness is a person. Peace. Ephesians 2.14 For he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. He is peace. Let's look at the shield of faith. Fixing our eyes in Hebrews 12.2 on Jesus, the author and perfecter, the completer and finisher of faith. He's the author of it. And we're going to see that he's not the only the author of it, but it is by his faith the faith of Christ. What did Paul mean when he said the shield of faith? I always pictured this is the shield of faith right here. And David would say the Kleenex box. It was the legionnaire scutum, the most famous of the Roman shields. The great scutum was large and either rectangular evil, uh, evil, oval, it could be evil, oval. Early oval scuta evolved into the rectangular, semi-cylindrical version, which were used by the foot soldiers of the early empire to great effect. Let's just look at that. This is what it looks like. That isn't a little shield. That is head to foot. And it's curved. That isn't this little shield. That covers you. And you know why it's curved? Because this is what they used it for. That is the Roman tortoise formation. That's is the shield of faith. Let Satan penetrate that. Do you know why it's curved? Let's just explain why it's curved. Can you keep that picture up, Jim? The Roman formation, let me explain it to you. The battle formation that made excellent use of the great scuda was the tortoise formation in which soldiers would gather close Align their shields both in front and on top. And what did this do? Interesting. This protected the group from, from frontal attacks and projectiles launched from above. That is what Paul had in mind. Not this little drawing we see where you've got this Roman soldier in a shield that is faith. That faith is who Christ is who protects you from the flaming 
arrows of Satan. Now that you have that picture in mind, it means something else. Let's keep going down. Back to the notes. Salvation. <clears throat> salvation. Put on salvation. John 3, 17. For God did not send the to send the Son into the world to judge the world, but the world may be saved through him. Put on salvation. And the last, the word of God. Well, that's the sword. That's, that's the Bible. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Everything we put on is Christ. He is our faith. The full armor of God is Christ. It is the person and identity of Christ. There is no ability to stand firm against the rulers and powers and spiritual forces of this darkness with only an understanding of the two-person gospel. Me and Jesus, we're going to see what the difference is soon. But when it's me and Jesus, I have faith in Christ. How can I have anything else? It's me and Jesus is in me. Therefore, I've got to believe, I've got to have faith in Christ. There's no power in me and Jesus. The two-person gospel is tantamount to knowing Christ in the flesh. As Paul said, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. So why is the two-person gospel going to defend you, to protect you. How is knowing Christ according to the flesh going to empower you? The second point. Faith is not of yourself. It is not of yourself. You don't generate it. It isn't the power of your belief. I need more faith. I asked the Father that once, and he says, you got it all. No, I need more faith. No. You need to know who you are. Galatians 2, 15 through 20. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. That word in the Greek means from. That is not in. You don't, you question that, you go to the Greek. By the faith of, from Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Even we have believed in Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by what? By the faith of Christ. Again, it wasn't a mistake the first time he said it. He meant it. And not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. No flesh. But if while ye, we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if we build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law. I'm, I'm reading this for a purpose. That I might live unto God. Galatians 2.20 in the context of the previous two faiths of Christ, he's about to make his statement again. 
I am crucified with Christ. And the life which I live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. You go to every other translation, I live by the faith in. That isn't what the Greek says. Three times in one chapter, Paul makes the point. Faith is a person. You want to live by faith in, you go right ahead. That's the two-person gospel. That's me and Jesus. That's living in the flesh. As Paul says, that is knowing Christ in the flesh. Acts 17, 28. <laughs> and we're going to go back to this verse soon. Not this verse, but this chapter. Acts 17, the famous Mars Hill. He was telling the Greeks, the greatest philosophers of the day, for in that unknown God, in him we live and move and have our being. How can you put on Christ any more than living, moving, and Him being your being? Ephesians 2.8 For by grace you were saved through faith. And this, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Wait a minute. I thought I had to believe I thought I had to, I thought I had to manufacture enough belief to believe that God is. And faith, and this not of yourself. It doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter your opinion. Faith is a person. The third point. Faith is the conduit of God's grace, power, and sonship. Some of you go, well, that's strange. Faith is the spiritual power of God that reveals and accomplishes sonship in the lives of his new creation sons. It is the power that pushes us through the spiritual convergence of me and Jesus to the understanding of oneness as the Son. Faith is the assurance and conviction of that oneness and our identity of the Father. 1 Peter chapter 1 pretty well says it all. Chapters 1, verse 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again, burst to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance. You know you are not getting an inheritance outside of being the Son of God. His inheritance does not go to his, does not go to someone who is not birthed. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away. Reserved in heaven for you. Are you ready for this? Who were protected by the power of God through faith. The power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Where have we heard that before? How about Romans 8, 19? Just to take a little rabbit trail from Peter. Paul says, 
what is being revealed in this last time, Romans 8, 19, for the anxious longing of creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. The power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last days. The revealing of the sons of God. The revealing of the inner makeup in the Greek. The invisible, the inner reality. That's what's being revealed. Today, Paul says, the night is soon over. Peter goes on to say in verse 6, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. But have you seen him? How can you love somebody you haven't seen, Jenny? And though you do not see him, you believe in him. How can you believe in somebody you don't know exists? Catherine, how can you believe in God? Did you ever see Jesus? And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy. Inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Faith has an end. It's at the beginning. You've been saved by grace through faith. It has an end. The outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. James says the perfection and the completion, the maturity. Ephesians 2.8, for by grace you've been saved through faith and not of yourself. Again, Paul is saying, grace through faith is at the beginning. Galatians 3, 14, and then 14 through 26, Paul writes in order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit Through faith. The promises of God. The promise of what? Oh, let me me just keep reading. Therefore, the law has become your tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. What was that promise? Through faith? For you are all sons of God through faith. It's the conduit of God. It's the revelation of the sonship in Christ Jesus. It is a person. It is is the conduit by which God moves you through maturity to maturity and completion. And I'm just going to say, right now, we are only on the foothills of the revelation of what faith is. You just wait till we get to the mountains. The revelation we're about to look at now is for those who have ears to hear. Because I'm going to tell you, this is soon to be fourth dimension. 
what Paul says in nine words. Point four. Faith is. This is what the Spirit told me months ago. Faith, Curtis, is union becoming oneness. Revealing identity. And I said, what does that mean? That's a, that's a phrase that I can throw out that makes me sound so spiritual. Faith is union becoming oneness. Okay, we can go home. What does that mean, Curtis? Uh, it's how he does it. <laughs> We're going to get into that in a minute. The Spirit often will give you things and then reveal them to you later. <laughs> union, faith is union becoming oneness, revealing identity. Our knowledge of Christ in the flesh, me and Jesus, becomes an understanding, becomes the understanding that in Christ, we are a new creation, a new creature, another person. <clears throat> Faith drives us through convergence. What is convergence? When two become one. The me and Jesus gospel, convergence takes that and turns it into one. One understanding. An understanding of one. Faith is the second. Knowledge. Becoming understanding. Edo. Becoming genosko. Becoming understanding. That's what faith does. We went through that four weeks ago. Last, faith is three dimension. Becoming fourth dimension. It is the temporal. Becoming spiritual. That's the three things faith does. But I want to focus on the first one. In nine words, Paul says, faith is union becoming oneness, revealing identity. Really? Where does Paul say that? Paul never says that. <laughs> Six months ago when the Spirit revealed that to me, I couldn't have told you this. But the Spirit explained. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the substance. Hypostasis. Of things hoped for. Substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Now if you had asked me that years ago, I'd have said, well... That's just God convincing you of what you believe. That's what faith is. Getting to a point where you're finally convinced of what you believe enough to make it happen. Let's look at this verse in three other translations. Now, faith is the substance. In the New American Standard, it's the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The Christian Standard Bible, now faith is, why did we study reality? Faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of things not seen. There's your three dimension going to fourth. I don't see it, but I have proof. And last, Let's look at the word, hypostasis, the substance. I want you to look at every one of these translations. A substance, assurance, reality, but one thing stays the same of what is hoped for. We have gone through a lot of trouble to explain the word substance. Hypostasis. 
But one thing stays for same, what stays the same. Whatever it's for, it explains hope. That word, hypostasis, may be one of the most complex words I've ever seen in the Greek. Let's look at what it is. It appears five times in the New Testament. Three in Hebrews. Why is Paul using that three times in Hebrews? And two in 2 Corinthians. Period. That word's significant. He doesn't use it a lot. It's a sparing word. And he uses it because he means something. What does it mean in the Greek? Confidence? Assurance? Okay. I got that. Giving substance. Okay, it's a substance of things hoped for. Reality. Hypostasis is the underlying state of underlying substance. It is the fundamental reality that supports everything. All else. It is the essential nature. Hypostasis is the essential nature of an individual. Hypostasis denotes an actual concrete existence in contrast to the abstract. Um, My reality is different than your reality. My truth is different than your truth. Faith is the substance, the concrete, as opposed to the abstract. Our English adjective, it's actually a word in English, hypostatic, 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 comes from the Greek word hypostasis. Would you be surprised to know that this term is also used in genetic science? Ooh. Hypostasis is the failure of a gene to produce its usual effect when coupled, when becoming in union with another gene that is epistatic toward it. This word is also a genetic word. This word has many facets of meaning. Let's look at where Paul uses it. Reading in the Berean literal Bible because it literally translates to Greek. Hebrews 1.3. Let's look at where else Paul uses substance. God. God, having spoken long ago to our fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways in these last days has spoken to us in his son god doesn't speak to me he uses the bible whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the ages who being the radiance of his glory, the exact expression of his substance, hypostasis, substance, the exact expression. This passage has created a doctrine. In the theology world, that doctrine is called hypostatic union. Let's look at that, what that means. Let me script, uh, we'll come back up to Colossians in a minute, Jim. Let's go down to the definition of hypostatic union. Hypostatic union is the joining of the divine and the human in the one person of Jesus. It states Jesus had two complete natures, one fully human and one fully divine. divine. 
What the doctrine of hypostatic union teaches is that these two natures are united in one person in the God-man. It teaches that Jesus is not two persons. He is one person. The hypostatic union is the joining, listen to this, mysterious though it be, it's a mystery. It's a mysterious thing. The union is the joining of the divine and the human in the person of Jesus. That's the word substance. One writer states, I love this guy. He says, the doctrine of hypostatic union is an attempt to explain how Jesus could be both God and man at the same time. It is ultimately, though, a doctrine we are incapable of fully understanding. It is impossible for us to fully understand how God works. We as human beings with finite minds should not expect to totally comprehend an infinite God. Therefore, we have assigned this unknown doctrine, hypostatic union, to this God becoming man. <laughs> We're never going to understand that mystery. We're going to assign it to the mystery doctrine, theology. Well, I'm going to teach you today about hypostatic union. We're not going to understand it, but it's the divine becoming human. It's the union of divine and human becoming one. We're never going to understand it. But we've given a name to it. Yes, we're going to visit that name in a minute. At Mars Hill. The statue to the unknown God the doctrine to the unknown mystery. Substance. Let's go back up to Colossians to finish the scriptures. <clears throat> Let's put some verses together. For faith is a substance of what you hope. Colossians 1.27 says, To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope. So now we've defined the hope. So let's reword Hebrews 11, 1 to this. Now faith is the reality of Christ in you. That's the hope. Christ in you, the hope. So let's just take the word hope and substitute it for the reality of Christ in you. Now let's go to John 17, 22. The glory which you've given me, he's talking to the Father, I have given to them that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity. The divine and the human soul. Now let's combine all three of those verses. And Hebrews 11.1 1 now reads, now faith is the reality of of Christ in you and oneness by which we become sons of God and are glorified sharing his essential nature. That's what Hebrews 11 one says. It's just Paul says it in nine words. You didn't know the word substance meant so much, did you? I love that verse that this guy, really, this guy's statement, let's go back and read it again. I like it so much, I want to read it again. The doctrine of hypostatic union 
is an attempt to explain how Jesus could be both God and man at the same time. It is ultimately, though, a doctrine we are capable, incapable of fully understanding. We're just going to have to call it the mystery doctrine. The doctrine of the mystery. It is impossible for us to fully understand how God works. We as human beings with infinite minds should never expect, oh, excuse me, with finite minds, thank you, Catherine, should never expect to totally comprehend an infinite God. I have one thing to say about this, quote, let this go into YouTube. Really? Quote, I have one thing to say about that last statement. Union, oneness, and identity is the answer to your thousand questions, including what you can't understand and refuse to receive. Let's go to Mars Hill with Paul. The Areopagus. The Hill of Ares, where Ares was tried in front of Zeus in Greek mythology. That's what the Greeks believed. The Hill of Ares. It's where the Greeks would go over almost 400 foot elevation above the city and they would debate the philosophy of the day. In fact, when Paul came to Athens, he said, why don't you come up to Mars Hill and teach us? Let us debate. What did Paul say when he got there? <clears throat> I noticed you have a statue to the unknown God. Let me tell you who that is. Let's go to Mars Hill, 2019. I notice you have a doctrine to union and oneness, and you don't know what that is. I notice you have a doctrine given to a mystery. Your doctrine of hypostatic union. I notice you got a statue over here built to it. I told us you teach your doctors, your, your theological students this doctrine. Let me tell you, Greeks, what that doctrine is. It's the birthing. It is a new creation son. Where the divine and the soul of man become one and reflect the identity of that son. What is the identity of that son, Curtis? I am. The identity of the father. I am. Now, we just had a, har a Mars Hill moment. In 2019, there are things still dedicated to what man does not understand. In the churches today, they don't know this. If I were to go to the Baptist church, I would have to say, let me tell you about the statue you've built to union and oneness of the divine birthed into the soul of men, into the spirit of man. The divine birthed into the spirit of man. The metamorphosis of that individual into the reality of that new creation. tell you about that because you obviously think it's a mystery. 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The mystery. Finally, the evidence of things not seen. That which the invisible are proved. The evidence of things not seen. Paul finishes that verse. That is the invisible that are revealed 
It is the spiritual, the temporal becoming spiritual. It's knowledge becoming understanding. It's your third dimension senses becoming fourth. In summary, I want to go over two diagrams that Jim has put together. I do stress Jim has put together. But I started teaching this with a passage from Star Trek. So I'll finish with one. For you Star Trek fans, The Next Generation, Season 2, Episode 5. Deanna Troy tells Captain Jean-Luc Picard, confidence is faith in oneself. Thank you, Deanna. Because you have just said what the two-person gospel is all about. Confidence is faith in oneself. With that in mind, let's go to the two diagrams that Jim has prepared. It's titled Renewing of the Mind. The first diagram, we're going to, this is basically the summary of everything we've spent the last four weeks teaching. We're going to look at it right now. Renewing of the Mind. Let's see. Let's see, Jim, do I click on this? You're going to have to do that on that one. You broke it, Jim. The first step, renewing of the mind. I'm going to try the main, main button too. <laughs> try that first. Revealed truth. The first thing that happens the Spirit reveals truth to you. It has to be revealed. You just don't stumble across it one day and go, oh, that was truth. The Spirit reveals truth. Let me try this button, Jim. Okay. That revealed truth becomes Edo knowledge. Edo is perceived with any of the senses. You can see it, you can read it, you can hear it. The Spirit reveals it to you and it becomes knowledge, Edo knowledge. I'm aware of it. I know about it. Let me try this button, see if this does it. No, go to the next one. That Edo knowledge must be received. We talked about that four weeks ago. You must receive Christ. In that receiving, what you know, Edo, becomes genosco knowledge. Union. Genosco union. You become in union with Christ. You receive Christ. You now are in union with Christ. Once you've received Christ, that union, that you, you now see something about me and Jesus. Me and Jesus. Sadly, that's not the way it was in the spirit to be, but it's the way religion has made it. So the revelation of the Spirit comes again to reveal oneness. But you have to receive that. I I know everything there is to know. Then you don't need the Spirit to reveal anything to you because you can't receive it. That Spirit becomes, that revelation becomes oneness. Genosco, union, becomes oneness. what Paul says in Galatians 2.20. Once you've received that revelation, we're going to see in a minute. There's understanding that takes you from that knowledge of union to the understanding of oneness. Oneness leads to... Go to the next one. 
identity. David once asked me, well, you got everything becoming one. What does one lead to, Curtis? Where does one take you? What does it reveal? It reveals identity. Who is that son? Paul says it this way. We've talked about this. Let's go to the next one. In 2 Corinthians 5, 16, even though we've known Genosco, Christ according to the flesh, we knew him in the two-person gospel. Me and Jesus. The next one. Yet now we know him in this way no longer. We talked about that. That's convergence. That. is a needle's gate. If you were with us last week, this means something. This is where what you know becomes what you understand. It's the needle's gate. Because once you know him no longer in the flesh, and you go through that understanding... You now can say with Paul again, Jim, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. But let's look at what the Spirit, let's let's pull up the next diagram. Me and Jesus, the truth, Here it is. Starts out with the Edo knowledge. Me and Christ. It goes to Genosco. That Genosco is union with me and Christ. And what is the becoming? What is next, Jim? Why do you think I've worn a purple shirt for three days? Three teaching days? David says it's because I have nothing else to wear. David, David wears a shirt with an S on it. This stands for the sun. My expression is purple. Why? Because we're going to see in a minute that the mixing of me and Jesus, of red and blue, creates another color, another person. It's neither red, it's neither blue. When red and blue become union, it makes purple. It's another color. And I put David's diagram on here so David can use this. And it incorporates what he's taught. That new creation is a new spirit. But your soul mind, which is the circle below, is becoming renewed, renewed to the revelation. The renewing of your minds. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That is what the new spirit is doing. It's the soul mind. It's the new spirit soul. But we don't know it right off. But it's what happens. Let's go to the next diagram. This is what we just discussed. Let's look at the second diagram. Let's pick up where we left off. Genosco. Faith in Christ. Everything you talk about and you hear in church, I have faith in Jesus. Go to the next one, Jim. That faith is your belief, your conviction, confidence, hope, a state of mind, positive thinking. That's what faith means in Christ. I believe in Jesus. 
I have a hope that Jesus will one day take me to heaven. Go to Joel Osteen. It's a state of mind. If you have faith in Jesus, then you can claim the promises of Israel. It's positive thinking. Don't ever tell me you're sick. That's not positive. Don't tell me you're having a stretch of poverty and poor. That never happens to believers. So when it's me and Jesus, we go to the next step. The little tiny blue me becomes a bigger Jesus in me. There's now two people, but Jesus is becoming more. I am becoming less, and Jesus is becoming greater. Let's go to the next one. This is what we want it to be like. A little bitty me and a big Jesus. What does this diagram have to do with faith? Pull up the scripture, Jim. Philippians 3, 4. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh. What did Deanna Troy tell the captain? Confidence is self-belief. Is the belief in oneself. Confidence. When it's faith of you and Jesus, there is no way you can have faith outside of faith in Christ or faith in myself. Paul said, I might also, though I might also have confidence in the flesh. That word confidence is a derivative of the word faith in the Greek. He could have easily said, I might also have faith in the flesh. He said, a derivative, I might also have confidence in the flesh. Self-confidence. Self-confidence. If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might have trust in the flesh, Paul said, I'm more. But what did Paul say next? Let's pull this up, Jim. The eye of the needle's coming. And it's called convergence. Paul says, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do commit and do count them but dung. That's what we did last week. Nothing of my identity would go through this gate. Everything I knew, everything I was, everything I believed, everything that was important about me couldn't go through this gate. It had to be surrendered. It had to be counted loss. This eye of the needle, he tells the rich man, sell everything you own and follow me. He was telling the rich man, give up your identity in the flesh and follow me. From that, I will promise you this. You will walk away from something. You will walk away. Well, that's pretty bold of you saying I'm going to walk away like the rich man did. No, I'm telling you, when you're told that, when the Spirit reveals this gate to you, you will walk away. You will either walk away from the revelation or you will walk away from your identity. You're walking away from something. Once the truth is revealed to you, you either receive it or you reject it. If you receive it, faith is taking you through this hole. And ain't nothing coming with it. Let's go to the next one, Jim. The result is this. Leave this up. And Paul says, and be found in him, 
not having a righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ. The righteousness which is of God by faith. That's where that convergence takes you. That's where that gate takes you. It takes you from faith in to faith of. It takes you from me and Jesus to I'm the son. And the essence of the father is mine. Faith of Christ, Paul says, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. <clears throat> There's that sun. There's the purple. This is what people can't get. Well, if I accept Jesus, it's got to be either me or Jesus. There's a third option. None of the above. A new creation. The process of sonship. Let's pull up the last verse, Jim. That I may know him. The faith of Christ. The righteousness which is of God by faith. That I may know him. Genosco. that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. This gate requires everything of you. You will not go through here to the revelation of the Son without walking away from everything. If it's too much for you, you can stay with me and Jesus. But as we talked about four weeks ago, that will fail. And there is failure. We're going to make a complete circle. That's where failure comes in. For if what you know is not truth, it will fail. It was meant to fail. The testing of your faith gives you endurance that endurance may have its perfect result, that you may become complete and mature and perfect. The work of faith. That's what faith is. It delivers you first to the new birth and then it delivers you to the Father as his son, perfect and complete and mature and full grown, the work of faith, the power of God, the person of Christ, revealed by the person of the Spirit. With that, we went long, but I say amen. Thank you for being here and listening.